This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, this morning is Independence Day. TR, you already gave me a thumbs up, didn't you? I think I'm just a little bit hot on the pulpit mic. Can you maybe back it down just a, just a hair? Uh, my lapel mic, is uh, the battery is dead, and my replacement batteries didn't charge like they were supposed to in the charger. All right. You still hear me? That sounds good. All right. Thank you, TR. Well, it's Independence Day. And I'm going to bring a patriotic message this morning that God laid on my heart actually a couple of weeks ago. So if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word. Our text is found this morning in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 14. It's only one verse long. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Proverbs, chapter number 14. Of course, the book of Proverbs is full of words of wisdom on many different subjects, but the subject of our text today, I think, is right on the money for what America is in need of today. Proverbs chapter 14, look at verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Again, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will take your word, for your word is truth, and apply it to our lives and to our hearts. Lord, apply it to our country. And Father, I pray that you would help us as Bible-believing Christians to be part of the solution that America is in need of today. Dear God, I pray that, Lord, you would put America back on the right course. Father, we know that it's our fault as Americans that she's not on the right course. Oh, dear God, we pray for your grace, for your enduring mercy. Lord, that America would not receive the end today that she deserves, but that you'd allow grace and mercy to intervene on our behalf. And dear God, I pray you'd do it. If not for the sake of the lost, do it for the sake of your own people, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The Bible says that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, there was a day and time when America was the pillar of the community in the world's nations. America was not only a, uh, a place that was a superpower in the world politically, militarily, and diplomatically, but America was a superpower in the world in that America was good and America was godly. I'm afraid that in the last 50 to 100 years that has been increasingly changing from one generation to the next. But America's foundings were much different than we see things in America today. At the time of America's founding, God was recognized as the foundation of the American Republic. This morning as I begin, I want to recount for you some of those early writings of our founding fathers. Some of the documents you will recognize, some of them may be new to you. But they all talk about the dependence upon God that they as individuals knew and respected and that America as a nation believed in her heart. I believe that if America is going to get back to those foundational principles, the foundational principles that, can we say, made America great, it will be because America returns to the Bible, to the Word of God, and a love for God. Right. I'd like to bring you a message this morning entitled, Righteousness 
exalteth a nation. You've probably heard of the first Thanksgiving. But the story you probably heard was the story of the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth Colony with the pilgrims up in Massachusetts. Maybe you didn't know this, but the actual first Thanksgiving in America among the English-speaking settlers that landed here happened a year before the pilgrims ever arrived at Plymouth Plantation. The colony of Virginia was first settled in 1607 in Jamestown. And in 1619, there were a group of Christians that traveled to the New World to settle in Jamestown, what was then the colony, as is the state today, by the name of Virginia. The Washington, Washingtonian newspaper reported in 2015 this version of the first Thanksgiving, a year before the pilgrims ever arrived. Listen to what it says. After a rough two and a half months on the Atlantic, the ship entered the Chesapeake Bay on November the 28th, 1619. It took another week to navigate the stormy bay, but they arrived at their destination, Berkeley 100, later called Berkeley Plantation, on December the 4th. They disembarked and prayed. At the behest of written orders given by the Berkeley Company to Captain Woodleaf, it was declared that their arrival must, and I quote, be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. So here we see the very first English colony founded in the New World, Virginia, the first thanksgiving that was held in which they gave credit to God for having given them the opportunity to start the colony, to come to the new world for a new beginning, a new life, a new start in life. But even from the very beginning of America's history, we see a reliance upon God and a recognition that it was all because of God. And all to his glory. Then the pilgrims arrived a year later in 1620. You know the Thanksgiving story surrounding the pilgrims. I'll not recount that this morning. But I would like to read some of the words of William Bradford, the leader of the pilgrims, when they arrived a year later in 1620. Listen to, to his account and his recognition that it was by God's grace and for God's glory. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. I know that's a lot of legalese sound type of speech, but did you hear what he said? We have undertaken this for the glory of God and for the advancement of of the Christian faith. You see those early settlers who came here to America. Many of them came for the express purpose. Of creating a place where God could be worshipped freely. And also where he would be glorified. Where the light of the gospel could be taken to the far ends of the world. That was the starting of America. But I continue, you're familiar with the Declaration of Independence. It's not the Constitution that established what form of government we had, but it came before the Constitution. 
It's the document that was signed by representatives of all 13 colonies and sent to the King of England expressing to the King of England that we had a right to be a free people. But even in that founding document, the Declaration of Independence, in declaring our independence from England, we declared our dependence upon God as a nation, as a people. Listen to the words of the Declaration of Independence that you've heard so many times before, but listen for the mention of God and His providence when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the declaration concludes further down with these words. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. Three different references to God and our dependence upon God and an acknowledging that rights come not from kings, not from governments, not from written constitutions, but from God Himself. That you and I receive our rights from the Creator Himself. Dear friends, much of the problems, many of the problems that are in America today in Washington, and in every one of the 50 capitals could be rectified in a moment if everyone returned to the understanding that rights come not from government, but from God. Many of our problems would be dissolved immediately. If there was a clear understanding and a resolve in the belief that rights come from God, And that governments have no business interfering in what God has established. Listen to the words of Patrick Henry. That great patriot from Virginia. The one that you remember most for that that statement, Give me liberty or give me death. But listen to what he said about Christ and about the importance of the Bible in America. Patrick Henry said, and I quote, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very peoples, for this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Patrick Henry was saying that America was founded not as a religious country. America was founded as a Christian country. America was not founded upon the creeds and the beliefs of religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the pluralistic world in which we live today, wouldn't it be great to have a politician in office or the Supreme Court of these United States to say publicly, America is not a religious place. 
We're not a Muslim place. We're not a Hindu place. We're not just a religion in general place. We are a Christian people. And this is a Christian nation that was founded for Jesus Christ. Upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. America is a Christian nation. Americans, including Christians, have been fed the lie that America is great because we have all these different hodgepodge of religions in America today. Dear friend, I assure you that America is not great because of Muhammad. America is not great because of Buddha. America is not great because of Confucius or Hinduism or any other religion that the world knows. America has been great up to this day because of the God of this book and because he was acknowledged from the beginning as the God of this country. And to the degree that we stray from the God of this book, we invite upon ourselves the same plagues, persecutions, and punishment that Israel of the Old Testament invited upon herself as she delved into wickedness, immorality, and idolatry. No, America is not great because she's a religious country. She has been great because she has been a Christian country. Listen also to these words of Patrick Henry. The Bible is a book worth more than all the other books that were ever printed. Boy, isn't that so. And Wouldn't it be great to hear someone in the White House today say those same words about the Bible? It'd be even better if they'd lived by them But it'd be great just to hear them say those words. John Jay, who was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, and by the way, the first president of the American Bible Society, had this to say. By conveying the Bible to people thus circumstanced, we certainly do them a most interesting kindness. We thereby enable them to learn that man was originally created and placed in a state of happiness, but becoming disobedient was subjected to the degradation and evils which he and his posterity have since experienced. He's saying it was man's sin that brought misery to mankind, not God's. Then he continues, The Bible will also inform them that our gracious Creator has provided for us a Redeemer in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, that this Redeemer has made atonement for the sins of the whole world and thereby reconciling the divine justice with the divine mercy has opened a way for our redemption and salvation and that these inestimable benefits are of the free gift and grace of God, not of our deserving, nor in our power to deserve. Here's the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And Brother Steve, he's saying that the Bible tells us about the Creator who sent a Redeemer, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. When was the last time you heard the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court stand up and quote from this book and talk about Jesus being the Savior of the world and saying that the entire world needs a Redeemer, a Savior? In the other things that we read, the words of John Jay, he talked about original sin. Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden that has polluted the bloodstream of all the rest of mankind since. The reason that man is born naturally sinful, not basically good. All of the French philosophers of the Enlightenment got it wrong. Man is not basically good. Man is basically bad. It's the opposite. All of our American... uh, School systems today 
are founded upon the teachings of John Dewey, the father of American education, who was a humanist and atheist and denied the doctrine of original sin that Chief Justice John Jay quoted so eloquently. Why do our schools not understand why children behave the way they do? Why do we have this constant political philosophy that the more we spend on schools, the less we have to spend on prisons? It's because we don't understand what John Jay understood as the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. That man is basically evil, not basically good. Man does not need to be educated. Man needs to be saved. It's not an educational problem. It's not an intellectual problem. It is a spiritual problem. And America will never get out of the problems that she's in if we continue to ignore the truth of God's word that man is a sinner. And the only solution to that problem is to have a redeemer. That man needs God. And apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, he'll never be anything but a sinner. And he only gets worse. The older he gets and the more sinners he's around. It's just a part of this world. Wouldn't it be great to have a chief justice on the Supreme Court to say what John Jay had to say? By the way, don't hold your breath in expecting the current chief justice of the Supreme Court to say anything about Jesus being the redeemer of the world anytime soon. But we should pray for his change of heart. Pray for his salvation and a change in the soul of America. John Adams, a New England Yankee no less, someone that I don't agree with politically in every way, at least had this to say about Christianity and the Bible. He said, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I have examined all religions and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I don't even know for sure if John Adams was truly born again. I have some doubt myself. But at least he acknowledged that the Bible is the best guidebook for what's right and what's wrong. He said that our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people and was inadequate for the government of any other. You want to know why the constitution worked? For the first 150 or so years... It's because America was basically a Christian people and therefore a good people at heart. But the more that America has been changed by the flooding of our shores with people from places who do not appreciate the Bible nor believe Jesus to be God in the flesh, the more that the morals have declined in America and God has been left out. There's a reason that the same constitution that worked for so many years no longer seems to work. Seems to be falling apart. The wheels coming off. And yet it's the same constitution. It's just a different people than lived under it before. The heterogeneous population we have in America today with people that believe any and everything under the sun. Our constitution was not written for that. It was written for a people that all together totally as one believe this book to be the very word of God and believe that our lives ought to be lived by this book. To that end, all of our laws originally reflected this book. Today, not so much. 
The laws in America have been so changed that many of them are counter to this book, not in line with this book. And the further we get away from the Ten Commandments and the other precepts of this book, the further we get into destruction, our own destruction, a trap of our own making, and fall into the pit that we dig for ourselves as a country. Alexis de Tocqueville was a politi political philosopher from France who traveled to America not too many years after the original American War for Independence, that Independence Day that we're celebrating today. In his book entitled Democracy in America, published in 1835, he made a lot of observations about America and America's greatness. He said, liberty cannot be established without morality, nor morality without faith. Now there's another quote that is attributed to him that may or may not have been actually said or written by him, but I think there's at least good cause to believe it may have been. Listen to this other quote. America is a great nation because America is a good nation. If she ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Boy, that's a scary thought. For there certainly was a day and time when America could have been said to be a, a good nation. Good people. And America was great. God did many great things in and through and with America. But as we look at America today, America is not as good as she once was. It only takes turning on the television or the radio or looking at the billboards as we drive down the road to see that America is no longer the clean, pure, good nation that she once was, but is much dirtier, much uglier than she once was. And if the key to her greatness then was being good, based upon the pages of this book, what are we to say about the present greatness of America as to compare it to what America was. Or even scarier still. To where we're headed. John Quincy Adams. Also president. I am quite certain. Was a godly. Bible believing Christian man. Unlike John Adams. I believe John Quincy Adams. Leaves little question as to. Whether he had trusted Christ as his savior. Listen to what John Quincy Adams said. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. Never since the foundation of the world have the, have the prospects of mankind been more encouraging to that hope than they appear to be at the present time. He was hopeful. America was sending out more missionaries around the world at that time than any nation had ever sent around the world. He continues, And may the associated distribution of the Bible proceed and prosper till the Lord shall have made bear His holy arm in the, in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You see, he believed that America was founded in part and was blessed by God in part because of sending the gospel to other places. And yet today, America has more missionaries coming to America than going out from America. My, how things have changed since the great century of missions in the 1800s. He also said this, In the chain of human events, 
the birthday of the nation, which is what we're celebrating today, by the way, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior. The Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. Here again is a president of these United States acknowledging publicly before all that America's greatness, the greatness of our republic, is based upon the foundations of this book. It's not because America is smarter, brighter, prettier, wealthier. It's because America was founded upon the precepts of this book. That's what made America great. And if we're going to see America truly great again, it will be because we return to the pages of this book. You know Francis Scott Key. He's the one that penned the words to the Star-Spangled Banner. Listen to what Francis Scott Key said. May I always hear that you are following the guidance of that blessed spirit that will lead you into all truth, leaning on that almighty arm that has been extended to deliver you, trusting only in the only Savior, and going on in your way to Him rejoicing. Francis Scott Key understood the importance of relying upon God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, our Savior. James Madison was not only a president, he is considered the father of the Constitution. Why? Because he actually did most of the writing of the verbiage that is today the original Constitution. He said, A watchful eye must be kept on ourselves, lest while we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, we neglect to have our names enrolled in the annals of heaven. He said more important than being president, more important than building monuments in this world is to make sure your name is on the rolls in heaven. When the roll is caught up yonder, I'll be there as the old hymn goes. He said it's more important to have a home in heaven than to build greatness on this earth. General George Washington became the first president of these United States. He's known as the father of our country. Listen to these words of George Washington. Lest the skeptics and the scoffers and the atheists convince you that America's founding was religious but not Christian. Listen to what George Washington said. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. General Washington, President Washington, said that anyone who seeks to undermine religion and morality brings destruction upon America is a traitor and not a patriot. There are entire books where the personal prayers of President Washington have been compiled. If you read those prayers, George Washington is not praying to some unknown God. He's praying to Jesus Christ. He acknowledged that Jesus was his Savior. He wasn't just a religious man, he was a Christian man. America has been a Christian nation. In 1892, the Supreme Court of these United States even acknowledged that America was a Christian nation, at least in 1892. Justice Brewer, writing the opinion for the majority of the court, in the decision of the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, had this to say. 
To revile with malicious and blasphemous contempt the religion professed by almost the whole community is an abuse. In other words, he says anybody that attacks Christianity, it's an abuse. He continues, Nor are we bound by any expressions in the Constitution, as some have strangely supposed, either not to punish at all or to punish indiscriminately the like attacks upon the religion of Muhammad or of the Grand Lama. And for this plain reason that the case assumes that we are a Christian people and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity and not upon the doctrines or worship of those imposters. What he said is that the, re the reason that Mohammedans, those are Muslims, and the followers of the Grand Lama, the Dalai Lama, Buddhism, Hinduism, that the followers of those religions have freedom in America because Christians make up the majority in America. Friends, can I tell you that as the number of Christians shrinks in America, true religious freedom is about to fly out the window. For those other religions, those other freedoms, those other world philosophies do not share the same appreciation for true religious liberty and freedom that Bible-believing Christianity holds. You can look at every society in the world that has abandoned biblical Christianity. You'll be hard-pressed to find true religious freedom, true religious liberty, Maybe in some form or fashion, but not like America has enjoyed. By the way, the same could be said for the status of women across the world. Where biblical Christianity thrives, women are elevated, appreciated, respected. In every culture where Christianity falls apart, is left behind, or cast to the curb, so too does the treatment of women devolve in society. And we see it all around the world. And yet we're inviting them all to America. Come one, come all for the big show. And when you get here, be whoever you are. There's no more evangelizing the world on their shores or evangelizing them when they reach our shores. Instead, we're saying America's great because we're a bunch of different kinds of belief in God. Call Him by whatever name you wish. Don't call on Him at all. It just makes us stronger. Friends, it doesn't make us stronger as America to call on Muhammad, to call on Buddha, or to say there's no God at all. For we invite His judgment when we say such foolish things. Justice Brewer continued in his decision, the, Holy, the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States in 1892. He concluded by saying, These and many other matters which might be noticed, after giving a bunch of examples, add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Friends, that's, a, that's an actual judgment that you can read, a decision handed down by the Supreme Court of these United States in 1892 of the majority of justices on the Supreme Court. That this is a Christian nation. President Teddy Roosevelt only wrote one book his entire life to the best of my knowledge. I actually have a copy from the early 1900s at home myself. It's entitled Fear God and Take Your Own Part. 
In that book, Teddy Roosevelt says very clearly that you can't be a good citizen without being a good Christian. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice to hear a president say that? You can't be a good citizen without being a good Christian. It's been quite a while since any president has said anything similar to that. They might talk about being religious, but rarely will you hear them talk about being a Christian. I don't know that Teddy Roosevelt was right in everything he said or did, but he got that right. You can't be a good citizen without being a good Christian. But something has happened in America. All of those quotes that we just read about America's godly heritage. Somehow or another it's changed. It's flown out the window. In 1962, school, school prayer was banned from public schools. In 1963... Thanks to Madeline Murray O'Hare and others, schools banned requiring the Bible to be read in public schools. In 1964, February of that year, the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show for the first time and their managers hired, paid, a whole flock of young girls to be there in the live audience and told them what to do when the Beatles began performing. It was propaganda. It created staged hysteria that swept across America among the young people of that generation. And it introduced sex, drugs, Hinduism, and Eastern mysticism. It was an attempt to unravel and tear apart the fabric of American society. To undermine biblical Christianity. But that was only one example. In 1965, the first curse word was used on primetime television in a sitcom. You say, 1965, it couldn't have been much bad. It was 1965. I won't tell you what the show was. You'd be shocked. It's a show you never would have thought any curse word would have been on, but it was, it was the first time. You see, they were just testing the waters. They were just beginning to try it out to see what the American response would be with the intent on changing America. In 1968, the Supreme Court of these United States ruled that states could no longer ban the teaching of evolution in public schools. While Bible reading was banned, prayer in school was banned, evolution could not be banned. As the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, it's science falsely so called. We now have a generation of school children who believe that evolution is the truth, that it's actually scientific, that it must be the way it happened. And they re regard whatever they hear in Sunday school on Sunday mornings for an hour a week as a fairy tale because five other days out of the week, they hear that evolution is the way we got here. Evolution is how everything got here. Some big bang that had nothing to do with God. In 1973, Roe v. Wade legalized abortion on demand. Since 1973, approximately 62 million innocent, unborn babies have been murdered in the womb in America. We talk about the problem that we have not having enough workers in America, having to bring them in from other countries, what if we had those 62 million people that have been murdered 
for the last generation. In 1982, the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Nebraska was arrested and the church padlocked. Why? Because in their Christian school in Nebraska, these United States, they refused to hire teachers or require their teachers to be state certified teachers teaching in their Christian school in their church. By the way, you might have already guessed it, Faith Baptist Church in Nebraska was an independent Baptist church. They believe the same things we believe today. The government has no business in what we do within the four walls of this building and how we teach our children. We do not require, if we had a Christian school, we would not require that the teachers be state certified. The state doesn't dictate what we teach in the church. It should be the other way around. In 2003, Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore put a monument to the Ten Commandments in the Judicial Building of Alabama. He was removed from office because he refused to remove that display of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in a courthouse they are the underpinnings of all of our legal system in America. And yet we're so ashamed or so afraid people might see and read the Ten Commandments and might actually do them that we've removed them from the courthouses. Or at least that's the effort. When we should be encouraging people to follow the Ten Commandments, not being ashamed of them, now, some of you already know this, some of you may not. Chief Justice Roy Moore and I are personal friends. We've spoken on the same platform on multiple occasions. In 2010, I invited him as a keynote speaker to the first ever National Tenth Amendment Summit that we held at the Atlanta Airport Hilton. We had literally hundreds of people from all over the country that support the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment, states' rights, state sovereignty. There were three keynote speakers that day. The first one was Judge Andrew Napolitano of Fox News. The second one was Chief Justice Roy Moore, the former Chief Justice of Alabama. And the third one was your pastor. Roy Moore told the story. I'll recount it in nutshell version here today. Judge Moore was a judge in Alabama. He had the audacity to put a small display of the Ten Commandments hanging on the wall in his courtroom in Alabama. The ACLU did what they always do. They made a ruckus, sued to have it removed and to have him removed. Judge Roy Moore said, I will not remove it. It is both a constitutional issue and a Christian issue. I cannot, I will not remove it from my courthouse. At that time, the feds, the Federal Justice Department, did what they usually do. They ruled in favor of the ACLU. And they said, Judge Moore, you have to get those Ten Commandments off the wall of your courtroom. He said, I cannot, I will not. Fortunately for the good people of Alabama, at that time, they had a man in office as governor named Fob James. Now, Fob James wasn't perfect in every way either, but at least on this occasion, he got it right. Governor Fob James said to the feds, uh-uh. The Ten Commandments are staying on the wall in Judge Moore's courtroom. You can come send federal agents to come take it down if you want to, but when they get to Judge Moore's courthouse, they're going to find state troopers armed to the teeth ready to walk your federal agents right back out the door. 
And by God's grace and for his glory and to the uh, good of all the people of Alabama, the feds decided they weren't going to take them down off Judge Moore's wall. They stayed there. Well, the people of Alabama saw they had a hero in Judge Roy Moore. They elected him to be Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court shortly afterward. As Chief Justice, he was in charge of the building itself for the Alabama Judicial Building. With private donations, no tax dollars involved, he had put together a granite monument about the size of this pulpit carved out of granite and rolled into the rotunda of the Alabama Judicial Building with the Ten Commandments inscribed on them. The ACLU did what they always do. They made a ruckus and said, you've got to get that out of the Alabama Judicial Building. And they sued Judge Moore to have it removed and to have him removed. I'm sorry to say that at that time, Fob James was no longer governor of Alabama. A man with lesser backbone and lesser character was in office. The feds did what they always do. They said, Judge Moore, you get that out of your courtroom or we're going to send federal agents to come take it out of your courtroom, your courthouse, the Alabama Judicial Building. The people of Alabama rose up and said, no, we support Judge Moore. The feds said, we're coming for it. The governor, I'm ashamed to say, said, come on and get it. It has no business being there. And federal agents marched into the Alabama Judicial Building that belongs to the people of Alabama and rolled the monument of the Ten Commandments out the front door under arms. Judge Moore was removed from the bench. My, how America has fallen to go from God being lifted up and praised and America touted as a Christian nation to now even the Ten Commandments are a blight can't be even viewed in a public building. America is under attack. And the results, the results are alarming. In 2015, the Supreme Court struck down every state ban on homosexual marriages in America which is supposed to be up to the states, not the federal government. It was an unconstitutional ruling. The states are supposed to make their own decisions, but the feds stepped in and made it for everyone. I looked at some stats to show where all of these things have brought us. In 2019, there were 15 million unwed mothers in America. That's staggering. 15 million. Think of all the children that are growing up in homes without daddies. God put the man in the home as the head of the home for a reason. He's to be the protector. Not just from somebody breaking into the house but from someone trying to destroy the morality of the family living in the house. 15 million unwed mothers. In 2020, the statistics say that approximately 50% of all marriages will end in divorce. That's a 500% increase since 1920. 500% increase. What has happened in America that caused that? What has changed in America? Prayer taken out of schools. Bibles taken out of schools. Pop culture. Television. Radio. Abortion. Attacks upon the church. 
All of those have contributed to it. In 2020, not only are more marriages ending in divorce, but more people are just not getting married at all and just living together without getting married. The stats that I found for 2020 said that among white Americans, only 50% of adults get married. That means the others, most of them are living together with someone, but not getting married. In the black population in America, it's even worse. Only 30% of black Americans are actually getting married instead of just living together. There's no home. There's no family. There's no daddy. And we wonder why. It's because we left the teachings of this book. Threw it out the window. In 2020, there were more than 2 million people incarcerated in America in jails and prisons. 2 million people. That's a lot. I'm not saying they didn't need to be there. But it's not because they did or didn't go to school. It's because they didn't get enough of this book. It's because they didn't get a personal relationship with Jesus. You say, preacher, that's a pretty dismal picture. Ah, but here's the good news as I end today. It doesn't have to stay that way. Our God is a gracious God. Listen. Listen. To what 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says in the Old Testament. It was spoken for Israel, but it's true for America. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. If there's ever been a time that America needed God's forgiveness and God's healing of our land, it's today. If you're here today and you're saved, can I tell you we ought to be praying not only for ourselves, but for America, for God's forgiveness and God's mercy instead of His judgment. Preacher, what does that mean to me? Well, can I say the same thing that Teddy Roosevelt said? You can't be a good citizen without being a good Christian. You and I ought to examine our hearts and our lives this morning. Chances are you and I probably have some things in our lives we need to get cleaned up too. We ought to start first with us. But we ought to begin praying for America. Pray for Griffin, Jackson, Thomaston, Locust Grove, Forsyth, wherever you're from. Pray for Georgia and pray for America. The very fact that we're still here means that we do still have a possibility of God's forgiveness. It can't be said for lots of empires that have come and gone and are no more today. We're still here. We still have a chance. When we have our invitation in just a moment, as always, the altar is open. Would you just examine your heart and ask yourself, Lord, is there anything in my own heart I ought to get rid of? Anything I need to clean up to be what you want me to be? If there is, just... Come leave it at the altar. Or if you'd say, Preacher, I just want to pray for America. Would you just come kneel and take one Sunday to just come kneel and pray for America? If you can't kneel, and some people can't, there are two pews here. You can come sit on a front pew and pray if you can't kneel. But would you pray for America? Would you pray for yourself? Would you pray for your church and for your preacher? Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Brother Jim, if you and Miss Mary would come.
for our invitation.